We're going to jump right into the teaching this morning. And man, I am so excited uh, about this teaching. And I know that it's going, to, it's going to help you and be a benefit to you. First of all, did everyone get a funnel when you came in? If you didn't get a funnel when you came in, go ahead and just pop your hand up and maybe the ushers will find you. Guys, there's a few hands that are up. Jackie is back there. He's getting on that. I'm going to go ahead and let you guys pass those out. We're going to use those in just a few moments. And while they're doing that, you can turn with me to Psalm 112. Psalm 112. We are currently in a series that I'm calling Unbreakable. If you look closely at the life of Jesus, there were many occasions when he could have easily broken down. How many of you have had some of those occasions in life when you could have easily broken down? Am I the only person here? Absolutely. We've all gone through those things where it would have been really easy for us to have a breakdown. And, and just like us, Jesus had many opportunities to call it quits. But if you look at the life of Jesus, Jesus was shatterproof. Jesus was durable. Jesus was made to last. Jesus was unbreakable, even when the odds weren't in his favor. And you know what? I'm not really sure what your life looks like this morning. You may be going, some really, going through some really hard things, and it may seem like that the odds are not in your favor, but I can tell you that you can still live this unbreakable life that we're talking about. How many of you believe that? You can. Jesus did. And and so can you. And he wants you to live in a way um, where, like him, you are shatterproof, you are durable, and you are, are made to last. Now, because he was unbreakable, Jesus walked differently than most. In fact, Jesus was the person that other people looked for whenever they were encountering the problems of life. And you know what? That same unbreakable spirit that was in Jesus has been transferred into us. Man, I think that that is awesome. The same unbreakable spirit that was in Jesus is also in me. Now, let's put that in context. Wouldn't it be awesome, like Jesus, if we were the ones that other people were looking for when life is pulling them apart? That's when a church truly becomes Jesus to their community. You know, people were looking for Jesus. They were going through hard things. They were having hard times. They weren't making it very well in life. And they would hear that Jesus would be in a certain area. And they would leave where they were. And they would go travel there just so they could be with him. Because they knew that if they got around him, he was going to have answers for their lives. And that same Holy Spirit that lived in Jesus lives in us. He's the same Holy Spirit that worked in Jesus is working in us. And he's here today. And you don't have to be a person who falls apart because the Holy Spirit is here this morning to stitch you back together. And I want to start, I want to start this morning with the definition of the word break. We've been talking a lot about what it means to be unbreakable, but let's start today with the definition of the word break. Break means this. It means to separate into pieces as a result of a shock or strain. Man, that hit me really hard this week when I was thinking about how that the enemy is working, maybe not to just bring this big mountain-sized problem into your life, but how that the enemy is working to just take the good parts of your life and break them apart into bad parts. Working to take those things that are good and pull them apart and make them bad. Why? Because if the enemy can separate your life into little broken pieces or separate your life into little broken fragments, it won't be long until you experience a major breakdown. And that is not God's plan for you. That is not God's plan for you. The enemy has a plan for you, but God has a plan for you. And God's plan is good. God's plan is good. Regardless of of what you're experiencing right now. What you are experiencing right now might be bad, but God's plan for you is good. If you don't hear anything else I say today, I want you to know that God's plan for your life is good. Before we read our text and talk about how to be unbreakable, I wanna share something with you right now that I think is awesome. As I was studying all of this out for you, I wanted to know the end result 
of learning how to be unbreakable. You know, we're on this unbreakable path. We've been talking about it. This is our third week. We're going to talk about it for three or four weeks at least past today. And so I wanted to really dig into this and see um, what the end result is. In other words, what does an unbreakable person's look li- life look like? What is the end game? How does this play out in their everyday life? What would be written on their resume? And here's what I found. Here's a list of their life skills. These are the life skills of an unbreakable person. Number one, they are unshaken by flattery or criticism. First John 2, 7. Number two, they have the ability to delay gratification. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 12. Number three, they can, com- they can keep commitments long term. 2 Corinthians 8, 11. Number four, they have a spirit of humility. James chapter 4 and verse 9. Number five, they are not ruled by their emotions. Luke chapter 22 and verse 42. They express gratitude. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8. They prefer others over self, Philippians 2 and verse 3. They are responsible, Titus chapter 2 and verse 3. They live in freedom, Luke chapter 16 and verse 10. I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty good to me. That sounds pretty good to me. When I look at that and I say, okay, there's the end game. That's where God is trying to direct my life. That's where God's trying to get me to. I think that that is substantial. And in Psalm chapter 112, we find a man like that. Let's go ahead and read our text together. Psalm chapter 112, it says, Praise the Lord. Blessed are those who fear the Lord and find great delight in his commands. Their children will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in their houses, and their righteousness endures forever. Even in darkness, light dawns for the upright, for those who are gracious and compassionate and righteous. Good will come to those who who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. Surely the righteous will never be shaken. That's a promise. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn will be lifted high in honor. The wicked will see and be vexed. They will gnash their teeth and waste away. The longing of the wicked will come to nothing. I love those verses and this series, I've taken this series right out of those verses and here's what we have learned so far. In week one, we found out that an unbreakable person praises or thanks the Lord for who he is and not just for what he does. And they're also delighted to walk in God's commands. In week two, we learned that an unbreakable person raises children who are mighty in the land by being level. We talked about that kids need level a level playing field they need they need a stable life they don't need to be living their lives on a roller coaster ride so when they're on a level playing field and when it's stable and when they have a great example being modeled to them then they have a platform from which to become mighty in the land now let's go ahead and say our unbreakable declaration and many of you have already gotten this and if you haven't then you can just read it on the screen behind me so let's go ahead and put that up, and let's just read it together. Here we go. I am unbreakable. I will praise the Lord. I am unbreakable. My children are mighty in the land. I am unbreakable. Wealth and riches are in my house. I am unbreakable. Even in darkness, I have light. I am unbreakable. Good will come to me. I am unbreakable. I will never be shaken. I am unbreakable. I have no fear of bad news. I am unbreakable. I will look in triumph on my foes. Awesome. Now, I have encouraged you to take that and to use that every day as a part of your personal prayer time. And I'm not going to ask you how many of you have been doing that, but I hope that if you haven't, you'll go ahead and start. And this is really good, especially for those of you who maybe you don't know how to pray for very long. You can take those declarations. You can speak that out loud, and then you can pray about each one. And so I encourage you to do that. This morning, we're going to move on. And I think that this might be my favorite teaching in this series. I like all of them, but I think this might be my favorite one. Today, we're going to talk about how to have wealth and riches in your house. 
wealth and riches in your house. And I, I've got to tell you, I am so excited about this one. And mostly I'm excited because I'm going to bring a biblical and balanced perspective to you today regarding wealth and riches. And so I don't know how many messages that you have heard um, on, on giving or how many messages that you have heard on money, but I can promise you that you have never heard one like this. So I want you to take notes this morning and I want you to give me your best ear for the next 20 or 25 minutes or so. Now, when it comes to wealth and riches, I think that we seem to have two different camps in our Christian culture. And I can say that because I've been a pastor now for uh, about 31 years. I know I started pastoring when I was about three. That's a lie. <clears throat> but I have been, I've been pastoring now for about 31 years and when you've been a pastor for that long, you have seen a lot of stuff. And some of it is really good and some of it is really not good. And I can tell you that when it comes to wealth and riches, there seems to be two different camps in our Christian culture. And one camp says this. One camp says, God wants us to be humble, and so God will keep us poor. How many of you have heard that teaching, though? I definitely have in my 31 years. And the other camp says, the other camp says, unless you're wearing a Rolex and driving a Rolls Royce, you're doing something wrong. How many of you have heard that message too? Obviously, as I said, we have, we have two different camps. We have one camp says God wants us humble so he keeps us poor. The other camp says if you're not rich, then you're doing something wrong. And the truth is this, if you look at the Bible and Obviously, how many of you know that's what we're supposed to look at? If you look at the Bible, both of those camps are in a ditch. And, and so today, really, I want to I bring some balance. And I think that, that the Holy Spirit has given me the proper information this morning to be able to do that. I want you to think with me for a minute about Jesus. Think with me about Jesus. Jesus, we know we know that Jesus was homeless, and we know this because Jesus himself said, foxes have their holes and birds have their nest, but the Son of Man doesn't have anywhere to lay his head. We know that Jesus was homeless, yet at the same time, we also know that Jesus wore a seamless robe. A seamless robe was only worn by the very rich. That's why the soldiers were gambling for his robe when he was crucified. They didn't want a souvenir. They wanted his robe because it was extremely valuable. It was extremely valuable. We have a homeless man wearing the garment of a wealthy man. That's the balance that we're looking for. Having plenty, but giving plenty. Allowing God to take care of your needs while at the same time not being afraid to enjoy very nice things. I think that if we're going to look at an example, we should look at Jesus as our example. So who was Jesus? Jesus was a homeless man that wore really nice clothes. I love that about Jesus because I'm created in his image. And you know what? I like to wear really nice clothes. And absolutely very, I don't even know what socks I got on today, but you know, like these are really tame. I mean, you know, I, you know, gee, think about it. Let's not skip over this. Let's not, let's not skip through this. Jesus was a homeless man who wore a seamless robe. Jesus is the perfect balance of everything that we're looking for in life. And we see, we see this principle in his life. And, and, and um, um, last week, we learned that when it comes to giving, you need a platform from which to give and how that you are blessed to be a blessing to others. Listen, God wants to fill your pockets so that he can use your pockets to bless other people. 
Now remember, we're trying to bring a biblical perspective today. See, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pump you up and, you know, and talk about give, 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 give so that I can take an offering later. We're not, that's not what we do here at Family Church. We're gonna bring a balanced perspective. God wants to fill your pockets so that he can use your pockets to bless other people. And if you don't believe that, stay with me. We see this in the life of the blessed man that we've been studying for the last three weeks. If you continue reading down through Psalm 112, it tells us something very interesting about the man who had wealth and riches in his house. It also says here that he was a generous giver. Now, in the natural, that doesn't make sense. How can you have wealth and riches in your house and at the same time be giving it away? And that takes us back to the principle that we learned last week about the upside down funnel. And most all of you or all of you should have received a funnel when you came in this morning. And we see we're going to use this again here as we talk about um, having wealth and riches in your house. Jesus was an upside down funnel. Jesus was poured into so that he could be poured out of. But what was poured into him came out in a greater capacity. It went in small, but it came out large. It went in small, but it came out large. See, every one of you, take that funnel that you have and just hold it in your hand just for a moment. Because here's what I want you to really get a hold of this morning. I want you to look at that funnel and I want you to turn it upside down, which most of you already are. You've got that funnel turned upside down. And I want you to understand this morning that this funnel represents your life. This funnel represents your life. I want you to keep it as a reminder that whatever God pours into you, you must multiply and pour that back out onto other people. So if God pours forgiveness into you, what do you have to do? Not just forgive, but forgive with a greater capacity than what was poured in. If God has shown kindness to you, if God, has, if God has poured kindness into your life, what are you supposed to do with it? It's supposed, you're supposed to multiply it and pour it back out in a greater capacity. If God has been generous to you, then it's supposed to flow down and come out in a greater capacity. And so I encourage you to take that funnel home and, and maybe even write some things on it some things that you've learned in this series. And I want you to keep that as a reminder that your life is an upside down funnel and that everything that God pours into you needs to come out in a greater capacity than when it went in. So what exactly, let's look at this verse again. What exactly does, does wealth and riches mean? I think that's a fair question. And, um, I looked it up in the original Hebrew in two or three different places because I wanted to make sure that I got it right. And in that verse, when it says wealth and riches are in his house, what it means is money and stuff. So stay with me. This man had money and stuff in his house. Now, I know that some people would be more comfortable if it said that wealth and riches were in his heart, but it doesn't say that wealth and riches were in his heart. It says that wealth and riches were in his house. Now, listen, your house, your house is a storehouse. And in the scripture, the storehouse was always the means to bless other people. You think about the storehouses that Joseph had built during the famine. Remember the story of Joseph and how that there were going to be seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. And so Joseph had all these storehouses built, which by the way, are more than likely the pyramids of Egypt. I know if you watch ancient aliens, they will tell you that man didn't build those pyramids, that aliens built those pyramids. But I'm here to tell you that God supernaturally gave those men the ability to build those pyramids. Isn't that awesome? And so Joseph had all these storehouses built. And they would bring the, the grain and the food in during times of plenty. So that whenever the famine came, there would be wealth and riches there. So that the people could come and they could get provision. And so anytime in the scripture we see a storehouse, it's for the purpose 
of pouring out into others the provision that God has laid up. Listen, your house is a storehouse. Your house is a storehouse. You don't just have a bank account. Come on, how terrible would that be if all you had in life was a pile of money? I could, listen, I'll tell you, and I'm going to go into this later, all money is to me is green paper. I don't care one thing about it. I don't care one thing about it. it all, all it does is give me the opportunity to bless other people. And the more I bless other people, the more God blesses me. What I'm talking to you about today is not a theory. And it's not my opinion. And so your house is a storehouse. You need to understand that there is a big difference between wealth and greed. A truly wealthy person gets pleasure out of blessing other people. So when the Bible talks about being a cheerful giver, that is someone who enjoys giving. I, I love Psalm chapter 35 and verse 27. And it says this, the Lord is magnified when his servants are prosperous. The Lord is magnified when his servants are prosperous. Listen, Jesus lived his life as a steward. Jesus understood Psalm chapter 20, chapter 24 and verse 1. And it says this, it says, the earth is the Lord's and everything on it. Everything on it. The earth is the Lord's and everything on it. It all belongs to God. Jesus managed everything that God gave him very well. And as a result, God constantly used Jesus to meet the needs of other people. People were hungry. Jesus fed them. Peter needed money to pay his taxes. Jesus caused a fish to spit up gold coins. I want to know where they're fishing. The wine ran out at a party. Jesus made more. To be like Jesus means to be a good steward. When you're a good steward, not only will you be a blessing to others, but God will be a blessing to you. Listen to this verse, Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 11. It says this, those who live to bless others will have blessings heaped upon them. And the one who pours out his life to pour out blessings will be saturated with favor. Isn't that awesome? Man, that is so awesome. I, I want to share this real quick because some of you weren't here a couple of weeks ago on a Wednesday night. Where's Brian and Heather? Okay, back there. Brian and Heather Delcor. Brian spoke on Wednesday night and, and he shared this story with us that I just thought was so awesome. And, and there are a couple of details that I found out later that I want to add. But basically, they had gone on vacation and they were trying to come back home and they couldn't get on the flight that they had booked. So they had to take another flight to a different town, right, Brian? And they had to rent a car when they were in that town and then drive all the way back to, to Lebanon at the end of their vacation. I think that would be pretty frustrating. But there was a couple there in the airport that was kind of watching all of this stuff go down. And before they left, this couple came up to them and said, you know what, we've been watching all this stuff that's going on. We know you guys are tired, you're ready to get home, you're frustrated. And God has been so good to us lately. Now, listen, they didn't know this couple, right? Didn't never seen them before ever in their whole life. And this couple said, we know you're frustrated and you're trying to get back home. And we just want to bless you. And handed them a check. And then later they looked at the check and the check was for $500. The, ma the amount that they needed to pay for the extra airfare and the rental car to get back home. Now, here's the, here's the thing that you might not know about that story. That couple is Javon and Angela Cleghorn. And they are, they are a young ministry couple that are in the process right now of planting a church. And they're in the process of planting Limitless Church. And so here they are in the process of church planting. And church planting is very expensive. And so what are they doing? They are giving away $500 to people that they have never seen before. Listen, church planting is terribly 
expensive. I remember when we, when we planted Real Life Church um, back in 2009, during that time, I only did this because God told me to. It was made no sense financially. I never recommend that you do it. Um, it was really the dumbest thing I've done ever. Um, but, but, you know, but God told me to do it, and so I did it. But when we planted Real Life Church, I cashed in my 401k to be able to do that. It cost, listen guys, it cost tens of thousands of dollars to plant a church, okay? And so God told me to do it, and so I did it. It cost so much money to plant a church, and so here we have this young ministry couple that are trying to get started, and what do they do? They live, Proverbs 25, 11. Proverbs 25, 11 says, those who live to bless others will have blessings heaped upon them, and the one who pours out his life to pour out blessings will be saturated with favor. <laughs> And you know what, if you are here today and the Holy Spirit is just kicking around inside of you right now at this moment, and the Holy Spirit is saying to you, I want you to give some money to Javon and Angela Cleghorn to help them plant Limitless Church, then I want you to go see Brian and Heather Delcor after this service is over because they're gonna get you the information that you need. And wouldn't it be awesome if that seed could come back to them 10 times bigger? Wouldn't that be awesome? Woo, man, wouldn't that be awesome? If they could call them and say, you know what? I've got a check for you for $5,000. Thank you for being obedient and faithful to the Lord. That's how it works. That's how it works. Listen, stay with me. We're not done. We got more ground to cover. Sometimes, listen, sometimes people get upset when they notice that someone else has more than them. Maybe they park their car on the far end of the parking lot at church because they don't want to see, they don't want people to see what kind of car they drove up in. And while they're walking out to their car, they see all these nicer cars. And they look at that and they say, well, you know, they get upset. They get, they get a little offended by it. Maybe they get bitter uh, with God about it. And I think that I finally figured it out. It's taken me 48 years of life to figure this out, but I think that I have finally figured it out. If someone has more than you, it's because God has assigned them to give more than you. And I can prove it in scripture. If someone has more than you, then God has assigned them to give more than you. The scripture says this, the scripture says, to whom much is given, much is required. So don't resent someone else's assignment. Stay in your assignment. And I could tell you that when you're faithful with what you've been assigned, God will assign you more. And that's not just my opinion. That's what the scripture says, and that's what I've seen in my life over and over and over and over again. So when I see someone that has a nice house or someone that's driving a really nice car, my attitude is always, Lord, give them two of those and give me theirs. <laughs> I don't resent that. I want it. I've always wanted a classic car, you know, like a like a 67 GTO, convertible, candy apple red. That's what I'm driving in heaven. And maybe on earth. So, I, man, I'm always like, Lord, that's awesome. Give them, give them another one. Give them three of those and give me theirs. You know why? Because because everyone has a different assignment. And the more that you have, the more that you have, it only means that you're assigned to give more. Right? So think about the, the widow that gave the, the two pennies in the offering. Jesus said, she had, you know, she, there's these rich people that come, they give a lot, and there's a widow that comes and she gives two pennies basically. And Jesus says, you see this widow? She's given more than, than anyone here today. Because they, they gave out of their abundance, but she gave out of her poverty. And so when you, the more that God gives you, the more he is assigning you to give. Now, man, come on, guys. This is going to help you in your life. 
if you'll just stay with me on it. The more God gives you, the more he's assigning you to give. Um, sometimes people will say, oh man, man, God is just blessing me. God is just blessing me. I'm so thankful. God is just blessing me. God is blessing me. And, and really what they should be saying is God is blessing me so that I can be a blessing. God is blessing me so that I can be a blessing, right? I mean, that's really what they should be saying. So let's keep going. How many of you want to keep going for a little bit? Okay, let's keep going. We're going to you whether you want to or not. So let's keep going. Having wealth and riches and being generous are connected. And I know that that almost seems counterintuitive, but in, but in God's economy, giving is the path to receiving. Amen. And I think that we forget this because the world's system is backwards. And the world will tell you, you have to have wealth and uh, the world will tell you to have wealth and riches, you need to get all you can. God, however, says having wealth and riches is tied to giving all you can. So godly generosity is the pathway to prosperity. And you may be thinking again, oh, oh, wow, this guy is going to give us all this information and then he's going to take an offering. Nope. Listen, I have no agenda other than helping you figure out this concept of having wealth and riches in your house. And this stuff, listen, this stuff is not a theory to me. The more generously we live, the more financially secure we become. And the more we have blessed other people, the more we have been blessed. You know, Karen and I, will have been married 30 years in September. That's a long time to be with me. So pray for her. <clears throat> but when we first got married, she was working full-time, and I was working one full-time job, two part-time jobs, and we were college students. And we made the commitment that we were not going to go into student loan debt. So we decided whatever it takes, how, whatever we have to sacrifice, we're not going into student loan debt, and which we didn't. Um, but every week we, we, we tithe. So 10% of our income always went to tithe. And then every month we gave a missions offering. So we gave that to our church. And so our church took that money and they used that money to make sure that the gospel is presented all over the world. And so for 30 years, for 30 years, you know, we would, we, would, we would give our tithe and then every month we would say, okay, we're gonna give above and beyond our tithe and we're gonna give this missions offering to our church to make sure that the gospel of Jesus Christ can go forward. And I could tell you guys, in 30 years of, you know, we've always had jobs and we've always worked hard and, and we've always um, given the way that God had, uh, to, according to the way that God had blessed us. And I could tell you that in that 30 years, the more we gave, the more God gave us to give. Listen, I don't understand how it works, but I know that it works. When we first got married, man, if I made, if I made $400 in a week, that was a lot of money. Now, that was back in the late 80s. We're going way back. How many of you can remember the late, late 80s? All the people with gray hair or no hair. And out of, that, out of that $400, man, we would say, you know what? God has blessed us and we're going to give because he says to, he didn't, he didn't give us this to keep it. He gave us this to give it so that he could give us more. That's been our philosophy all through life. And I, I, you know, I don't have any problems telling you this because I don't mind bragging on Jesus at all. Recently, listen, the most money I've ever made in one day, most money I ever made in one day was $42,000. And I made that through writing. Why would, why would God do, why would God do it? Because he's assigned me to give more. <laughs> it's like, he didn't assign me that so that I could have more. He assigned me that so I could give more. And man, I'm looking forward to the day when, when that's not $42,000 in a day, that's $420,000 in a day. I'm looking forward to being able to give more. That's the way, that's the way that it works. Now, let's, let's keep going. Let's bring this point back to Jesus. Jesus lived a supernaturally generous life, and because of that, 
he received far more than he lost in every way. Think about it like this. He gave his life, and what happened? He was resurrected to eternal life. He suffered temporary pain, but what happened? He paved the way for us to spend eternity in a place where there is no more pain. <clears throat> God took every generous gift that Jesus offered and he multiplied that back to him and God will do the same for you. Now I'm going to close. <clears throat> I'm going to close with this. The opposite of generosity is greed. And greed will keep you trapped. So I feel like that I need to at least talk about greed for five minutes. A greedy person can have a lot of earthly goods, but not have what the Bible describes as wealth and riches. Especially if they became rich by taking from other people or by cheating other people. And here's why. Greed doesn't enjoy anything. Even if you have a lot of money, you're not rich if you're miserable. And so greed, what does greed do? Greed covets, greed craves, greed claws to get what it wants most, which is more. And so greed pushes you to keep what God has given you to give. What God has given you to give. And it's really hard for a greedy person to start tithing. It's not that they believe that they can't survive on 90% of their income. It's just that they feel this compulsion to keep it. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 27 says, Whoever is greedy for unjust gains troubles his own household. And I could tell you this morning, if you've struggled with greed, the antidote is contentment. Contentment is enjoying what God has given you to be steward over little or much while you are here on the earth. When you're happy and found faithful with what you have been given, God will give you more. But greed is dangerous because it can't enjoy anything because it always has its eye on something else. And I want to read three verses as we close. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 11 says, who, um, says, Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned that in whatever situation I am in, to be content. Whatever situation. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5 says, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Here's another great verse. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6 says, But godliness with great contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. <laughs> we came with nothing. We can't take anything out of here. All we can do while we're here is lay up treasure in heaven that's waiting for us when we get there. That's all we can do. And I realize that this has been a little bit different, I guess, maybe a little bit different kind of teaching this morning. It's a stewardship sermon, really. But listen, guys, all I can tell you is that the righteous, the, the righteous man, the blessed man in Psalm 112 had wealth and riches in his house. He was a generous giver, <laughs> and yet he still had wealth and riches in his house. God was pouring in, and he was pouring out. He was a funnel, and God wants to use you to be a funnel as well. All right, we're going to stand. And the musicians are coming back today. Lord, I'm so thankful this morning that, that this life is something that you already have figured out for us. That we don't have to worry about the things that other people worry about. The things that those who aren't your children are sometimes stressing out over. Maybe sitting up at night over. Um, just kind of wondering how they're going to make it through, getting by week to week, month to month. Lord, you didn't set up your economy that way. And you sure didn't intend for your children to live that way. And so, Lord, you promised us that in your word that if we would work hard and that, that if we would be good stewards over, over the money that we have earned um, with our two hands, that you would take that and that you would multiply it and make it go, go further. And you know what, Lord, this is not something that I read about in a book. 
This is not something where I went to a conference and I heard all this great teaching on, on, on giving and then I'm able to come back here. No, 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 Lord, this has been walked out in my life for the last, well, for the last um, 30 years for sure. But even before that, this is something that has been walked out in my life. And so today, God, all I, all I am here to do is present this information and then the Holy Spirit can do with it whatever he wants. And so today, we're thankful for our assignment, whatever it is. Some of us have been assigned right now to give little. Some of us have been assigned to give much. And so we pray today that you keep us in our assignment, keep us faithful with what we have. And Lord, we know that you'll be faithful. You will be faithful to pour in more. Keep us balanced this morning like Jesus. He was, Jesus was a homeless man who wore the robe of a rich man. <laughs> I mean, you talk about balance. You talk about two sides of the same coin. Wow. That's remarkable to even think about that. And so, Lord, I, I pray right now. First of all, I just pray today over the finances of the people here at Family Church. And I get it. I know that sometimes we get upside down and stuff. Sometimes before we get information that will help us, we, we make bad financial decisions. We sometimes buy cars we can't afford. We get in houses that where the payment's too much, or maybe we um, foolishly get into credit card debt, and now uh, we're a slave to the lender. And I know that sometimes we make really bad financial choices. I get that. Um, but Lord, I also understand that at the same time, that as we learn to reverse those choices, um, as we learn to start making better financial choices, that the Holy Spirit will partner with that and that we can make a quantum leap. We could jump past the next logical step. We may be looking at this mountain of debt, but when we decide to get biblical with our finances, we can make a quantum leap. We can jump over that mountain, Lord, and you can get us to a healthy place financially far quicker than it ever looks like on paper. And I'm, I'm so grateful for that. Lord, so many times in my life, I've put it on paper and I've said, okay, we can get there in X amount of days and then commit it to you, Lord. And then we get there in half the time. Wow, it's just amazing. And so today it just starts with a decision. It doesn't start with someone writing a check and putting it in the offering. In fact, Lord, I would prefer that they don't do that right now. I don't want them to leave here with an emotional and have an emotional response and just give all this money. Lord, I, now I, I want this to soak in and I want this to be something that truly becomes a part of their lifestyle and not a one and done kind of thing. And so Lord, today I pray for those who maybe made some bad financial choices. Lord, today it just starts with a decision. And if you're here and you've done that, maybe you just, maybe right now, you just say, Lord, um, I've made some bad choices, but I commit, I commit my financial situation to you right now. I give it to you in Jesus' name. I wanna be a good steward. I want, I wanna walk in my assignment and I need, I just need help at this point to move to, me, to move forward, just to take the next step. And so, I'm, so if that's you, just talk to God right now about where you are and he understands and he'll help. And so Lord, I just pray that God over your people today. And then Lord, I pray for those, there, there may be some here, maybe there's some watching online this morning who, Lord, you've been speaking to them for a while about, um, about um, uh, being a blessing to others. They've been so blessed and they have all of this, they have all this in the storehouse and, and maybe for a while, God, you've been speaking to them about it and, and they've just been reluctant. They've just kind of been uh, stuck in a holding pattern. And, and Lord, I pray that, that the Holy Spirit would give them that extra nudge that they need today to be able to go ahead and, and, and to sow that seed. Maybe you're speaking to someone about helping this couple that we talked about earlier who's planting this church and that you're speaking right now like, hey, I want you to help them to do that. Lord, help. Lord, I pray that you would just increase our faith for that today. We can't give what we don't have and we shouldn't give what we don't, what we above our tithe, what we don't feel led to give. And so God lead us in that today. And we're just thankful for it right now in Jesus name, amen. You can look this way this morning. I want the prayer team to come and we're gonna do something, you know, maybe a little bit different today. We're gonna, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna obviously sing 
uh, one more worship song as we go. But let me ask you this. How many of you, and don't lift your hand if you don't mean it, how many of you truly want to walk in your financial assignment, whatever that is? Okay. Now, what if you leave here and God drops a million bucks on you? What are you going to do? I didn't mean that, Lord. Yeah, you better, you know, when you, when, you say, when you say yes to God, you better be ready for whatever it is that he brings, you know? And so if you're like me, you know what? I want to walk in my financial assignment. I told you earlier, I don't care. To me, money is green paper. I don't care one thing about it. I don't. I, you, know what makes, you, know what be, you know what would be my dream job? My dream job would be just traveling around, giving people money. That would be, is that a... Is that a philanthropist? Is that what that's called? Or is that someone who takes your blood? No, that's a phlebotomist. No, I don't want to be a phlebotomist, but I want to be a philanthropist. I would love to be able to just drive around and be like, oh, you need a, you need a new roof? Okay, well, here's $10,000. God bless you. You know, I mean, to me, that would be, that, that, that would be, as, that would be the, the most fun thing ever. And I just want to be in my assignment because my assignment might be to give someone 10 bucks. And you know what? There's as much joy in that as there is giving someone 10,000 bucks for a new roof, okay? So I just want to stay in my assignment, whatever that means. And so the more God funnels into me, the more I'm going to funnel out. And, and then the more he's going to funnel in and the funnel just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and man, we, we do that here at Family Church. We practice that here at Family Church um, with the finances that, and the money that you guys sacrifice and give every week. We practice that here. And, um, and um, you're going to know some more about that real soon. <laughs> but um, we're going to pray right now. And then we're going to sing. And if you're here today and you have any kind of need going on in your life, we want to pray over you. But I want to pray over those. We have some people who, who are pretty sick this week with COVID. Um, Kathy Miller has been really sick this week with COVID. I talked to her yesterday, prayed with her over the phone. And, and I want to pray for her today. Josh Richardson has been pretty sick. And um, I want to pray over him. And I think Jesse Rutledge has been, been, been pretty sick too. And, and we just want to pray over them today and, and just pray that God would, uh, would minister to them and help them. And then I want to pray over you. You know, we do this every day anyway, but I just want to pray that, the, that you just have like this... Uh, protective shield around you and that wherever you go, you, you know, COVID may hit that and it just going to bounce right off of you and not get in you or on you. So would you pray with me this morning? Lord, we thank you today for our church family. And there are many who can't be here right now because they are struggling, unfortunately, with COVID. And Lord, we're thankful that no one is, no one is um, critical. That's awesome. But we also know, Lord, that there are many who just feel like uh, they have the flu. They just feel terrible. And Lord, I, I believe today that, that you're going to go to them right now. Lord, Kathy Miller, um, Jesse, Josh Richardson, Lord, others. Um, I pray, God, uh, that health and healing would be their testimony and that they would rise up. And even this afternoon, they would, they would start to feel better. And even before evening time, uh, they are just completely on the mend. And so today, uh, God, I thank you. I thank you in advance that they are healed and they are whole and they are well. And Lord, then I pray for the remainder of Family Church, those who are watching online, those that are in the building, those that are back and unplugged. God, we pray that you would just be that, that shield about us. That's what your word says. The Psalmist David uh, often said, Lord, you are a shield about me. And I just pray, God, that you would be that shield about us, that you would protect us, that there would be no, uh, that there would be not only just no COVID, but there would be no sickness, Lord, of any kind that would penetrate that shield. God, that you would just keep us safe and protected today. And we pray that and we believe that and we're thankful for that right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're gonna sing this last song together. And if you need prayer for any reason, we invite you to come this morning. And if not, let's just, let's just worship.